Hello. Hello. Hello and this welcome. Is... <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to another episode of Style Talks. And we're here. I'm uh, Matthew Fall McKenzie. And I am uh, Gio Penichetti. And we're here Gio. once again, here once again to talk about art. And on this second episode, we're going to talk about symbolism. And it's going to be a primer or an introduction into symbolism and our understanding of symbolism as a movement and as uh, an element of Western art and an element of our own art as well. And also its importance to like a lot of contemporary discourse and aesthetics in art. Yeah. Yeah. So we've both been reading this book called Symbolist Art by Edward Lucy Smith and we're mainly just going to focus on the origins of symbolism and uh, the beginnings I suppose are found in uh, the Renaissance and in old master works. A good observation to begin with would be that just in some ways as let's call it the perennial school of philosophy was in the later half of the 20th century had to sort of been buried by Western academia. The symbolists were sort of lost to time until very recently. And I find this interesting because the symbolist art movement, as we know it, was basic, basically created the seeds of what people in a cliched sense refer to as quote unquote modern art or contemporary art. Yes, absolutely. Whether it be abstraction, the free play of symbols, and sort of the, to use a Delusian term, the deterritorialization of how symbols and visual art interact with each other. Mm -hmm. Because really the symbolists were masters at propping up paintings that were allegorical and had layers upon layers of interacting symbols. A good distinction to make yeah. early on as well is the difference between symbolism and allegory because yeah. it talks about this in the first chapter of the book where you have allegory as a way to tell a story but in an allegory each piece and each symbol is contextual and depends on the story that's being told overall. So the figure of Eros or Cupid or something, or a peacock, for example, or a certain type of landscape being used, a certain colour of clothing or a bird or something like that, these can be used in an allegory in order to represent something that's contextual, whereas in symbolist work you see often the symbol itself is the focus of the work rather than the context in which it's used to tell a particular story. Yes, exactly, and also we should note that symbolist art and of course we're visual artists but symbolist literature and symbolist poetry in particular poets that really created uh, literary modernism such as Mallarmé uh, they had a very similar lyrical or rhythmic or almost musical play of symbols as being this abstract in some ways focus on the symbols themselves and focus upon a loose connection of symbols with each other mm. that don't necessarily denote a specific narrative or allegory. This encourages the viewer as well to start meditating on these symbols and putting them in a context of their own experience. And I suppose this does lead to a greater sort of focus on individualism or maybe reflects the focus on individualism that was created as the Enlightenment you know, era came into being. And symbolism is in this weird space because Certainly, the seeds of modernism is present in symbolist figures such as Paladin, but they, they sort of, on the one end, embody the modern aesthetic ethos of art for art's sake. But in another way, there's also a tension with this dissatisfaction with Enlightenment values and with industrial and later on industrial modernism mm. itself. So the symbolists very much are trying to tap into and, you know, because of their neo-Catholic and neo-Platonic influences, they're trying to tap into, quote unquote, the one, the primordial, the, uh, the logos, if you will. But at the same time, they're doing it in a very individualistic way that incorporates a lot of... Uh, a lot of differing polysemous influences between different wisdom traditions and occult mm, traditions yeah. because a lot of them were very inspired not just by the European wisdom schools but also they had a very direct connection to a lot of the 
wisdom schools of the Far East, like Sufism and so forth. I think this is reflected as well in their willingness to disregard and turn on their heads the academic ways of making art in themselves and yes, developing exactly. very very personal styles as well, which sometimes veer uh, even into the realms of abstraction. Well, let me just pull a quote out of the book. When it talks about the influence of Neoplatonism and Plotinus mm. on the symbolists, this is a, near the beginning. The cumulative symbolism of this sort continued to play an important role in Italy, Italian art under the up until the 16th century. St. Plotinus, for example, said that the mystic philosopher is, quote, at one who presses onward to the inmost sanct- sanctuary, leaving behind him the statues of the outer temple. Mm. So in the context of symbolism, once you get to the leading symbolists like Chavanet, it becomes very apparent that they're trying to connect to something that is purely metaphysical, that isn't simply aesthetic the way aestheticism later became. Mm. And this means there has to be some kind of disregarding of conventions of realism and things cannot be represented in the way that they're seen by the eye. Exactly, exactly. And this obviously and so, naturally naturally flows into the realms of pure abstraction as you get later on into this search to, as he says, press on to this innermost sanctuary. Exactly. Because as it says in the book, this is page 16, in Renaissance and post-Renaissance painting, it remains difficult to separate the idea of the symbol from the idea of the allegory. The originality of the 19th century symbolists was that they were, quote, willing to make a distinction in theory which had to some extent long existed in practice. So this is what I would interpret the symbolists as being uniquely within their own moment historically in Mm. the history of art, in the history of religion even. You could say that there was a constant shift in academic art away from the original intent and purpose of the spiritual qua aesthetic. And you could say that the symbolists abandoned high realism that you found in the academy in a pursuit of a more purely metaphysical goal to achieve a vision that is, let's say, similar to Chinese literati painting and Greek iconography and things of that nature. So you always had from the very beginning, and this is, you would say, the modern traditionalist is wrong to cast aside as abstraction because Mm. abstraction was something that was always deeply embedded within spiritual art and metaphysical art and so the symbolists really took this and ran with it and as we will see later on with the painting by watts so you wanted to talk about the first painting I think it's interesting to talk about uh, Botticelli's Primavera as a proto-symbolist work. And I'll, I'll give you a quote from the book here. It says here, So the point was well taken in the 15th century Florence. Botticelli's Primavera, for example, invites the spectator to extend the picture and its meaning within the recesses of his own mind after the fashion that Plotinus seems to suggest. And in Primavera, the great attention must be paid to the group of the three graces, to their attitudes, expressions, dress and ornaments as well as to their simple presence. Uh, Renaissance philosophers interpreted the graces as an emblem of three different aspects of love and named them accordingly. In Primavera, it is Castitas or Chastity, whom blind Cupid threatens with his arrow. Castitas stands opposite to her wilder sister, voluptuous or sensual love. Pulchritudo or Beauty is the third of the sisters, is less vermin, but nevertheless sides with voluptuous. So... <laughs> So here, it's it's interesting because the first thing that popped into my mind um, when you look at this painting, but but just what you've described the uh, the three sisters, it's funny because that's almost like the archaic primordial idea that you find, of course, most you know cliched explicitly in Sigmund Freud of like id ego super ego. Mm. <laughs> that's sort of a theme that you know, and, you know that's not an original concept of Freud. Of course, mm. he borrowed that from. You know, he was into very weird things that he sort of very believed on, like he was into <laughs> hypnosis and things like yeah. that. But, but what becomes very interesting about this picture playing compared to academic art or even compared to Renaissance art is that there, it's just the figures, and there isn't 
very much depth in terms of the picture plane. It is a tapestry, the way you would mm. find in the Far East, or the way you would find it in certain medieval pieces in illustrations like the Book of Kells. You have this free allegory that is just this shotgunning of symbolism. There's three dimensionality, it isn't pure abstraction. But you could sort of see the seeds of a flat picture plane that, you know, people like Clement Greenberg would say is, you know, the height of modernism. Now, that's super interesting to me because what associates us with this idea that when you're looking at a, a metaphysical realm or you're looking at something that's not representational, that there is a flatness to it or there is... How, mm-hmm. how does this translate to this tradition in art? Because I was, I was in National Gallery recently and I was looking at these medieval altarpieces from the 13th century and the 12th century. And so it was a Fra Angelico and he made this piece called uh, Christ Glorified in the Court of Heaven, which is a large section of an altarpiece meant to go below the uh, the main section of the altarpiece and you have all these saints arrayed all facing inwards towards Christ victorious with a banner showing his victory over death and there's a deliberate representation here of everybody is the same size even though they're represented in three different rows supposedly receding away from the viewer but he's chosen to represent everybody the same size everybody is of equal importance in the sense that they're all saints or they're all um, meant to be represented in a way which is not simply their physical being. Yeah, and you'd see the same in, in Titian and then later Burne Jones and things like that. And the size of the figures is also something that nowadays I think is very alien and very very kind of quaint to us where you see in medieval art the figures are often depicted at very drastically different sizes to one another sometimes you'll see the uh, the patrons for example are depicted in a medieval altarpiece the, the people who paid for the work and they're often depicted very much smaller than the virgin and child for example but there is something about this I'm, I'm interested in this because taking up these conventions and possibly learning from why this speaks to us in a way of this is this is representing something metaphysical exactly because these figures are literally larger than life they're larger than the corporeal reality of say realism Mm. And, you ha- and you have, I think, in symbolist art in particular, I would think even more so than contemporary or modern art, you have this tension between the tendency between the abstract, the metaphysical, the spiritual, and the aesthetic, the romantic, and realist. So you have people, for example, the great critic and patron of symbolism, uh, Paladin, who explicitly like puts his foot down you know like he explicitly says um no pleasantness for its own sake no uh social realism of any kind Mm. it has to speak to a reality beyond this one as i was reading the book i sort of wrote down referring to symbolists such as radon that it is the world and it's double it's the doubling of existence and experience and being Mm. it is what heider would say the concealment and revealing of being That's the primary aim of the symbolist painters. They want to articulate the virtual, the metaphysical, what is literally the Neoplatonic above world. Let's have a talk about this Titian piece, the Allegory of Prudence, because we're still focusing here on allegory, on the things that before before things turned into pure symbolism. It's the jump off point. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this is a piece which I saw in real life uh, a few days ago in the National Gallery, and when I saw this piece, you know, I'm struck by it's a bizarre, bizarre piece. It's very strange. It's kind of willfully strange, and it's it jumps out at you when you're in the room. At, you, you're immediately drawn to this piece because it doesn't really represent it's not trying to represent what the other pieces that are in that same room also painted by Titian are really trying to represent you have you know these more kind of uh, fun romps I suppose through pagan pagan allegories where you've got Diana hunting and you've got uh, Bacchus and Ariadne but you've got this in the corner it's very very severe it's obviously a warning, this picture. This is directed at young people as he was uh, in his 70s when he painted this. Yeah, and the fact that it was so different from everything else that he painted too, it was near the end of his life and it was 
you're right. It was sort of like a way of telling younger people this is what to expect. <laughs> <laughs> and the way that you have, like, like you were saying, that there is a free play of symbols here. You've got text incorporated at the top, and there's not really much care taken for. You know, the, the technique here is kind of secondary. You can tell that he's painting almost automatically. He's not really considering too much his technique. He's not taking too much time to, you know, paint everything nice and pretty. The animals are represented quite crude. I mean, the whole the whole painting is painted. It, when you see it up close, it's very rough and ready. It's designed to have uh, energy and verve to it, but it's also meant to be quite stark, I think, and, and not really very pretty. Well, even you could even see in the painting in the corners, you could see a little bit of his his grisaille layer showing the very initial color layers like it's not a typical titian painting that's very very worked to being specific and painterly and so forth i think that this yeah. is this can definitely be called a proto symbolist work and it's interesting that it does convey it conveys a moral lesson obviously the, the text at the top to people who haven't seen this painting up close it says, uh, to the past, the prudent man of today does well to turn if he does not wish to risk the future. And that's represented in Latin there. And above each head, on the on the left, you see the old man's head, which is, uh, as some say, a self-portrait, probably very likely a self-portrait of Titian himself at this mm-hmm. age. Um, so it says, to the past here. And then in the middle, you've got this man in the fullness of his, you know, uh, his maturity, his virile power <laughs> is a lion. <laughs> his, yeah. And you've got, obviously, the lion, the representation there underneath of, of this. It's interesting that the lion, when I saw this painting in real life, I was struck by the fact that these are both dogs here. You've got the wolf on the left and you've got the dog on the right. Uh, and yeah. the lion is kind of an odd one out where he's in the middle. Um, and that's that's where there isn't really a coherency. You know, you're not saying that these are related in any physical sense. They're related purely by what they represent and... Uh, what attributes each of life. yeah that's right yeah because think of it the the work the allegory of prudence and if we know if we've read aristotle uh Phronesis, prudence can only come with age with good judgment with mm. experience so you have the boy who i think didn't they speculate it was one of titian's sons or something like that yeah his son this is his son orazio and his young nephew marco vercelio so I a family think, yeah, portrait. because they kind of look similar to him. So you have the young, the very young one with the with the dog. So the dog is loyal, has no experiences, like mm. in the throes of youth. But he represents you eagerness have- as well. That, that's that's something I learned when I listened to the audio guide when I was in there. That the dog is a representation of eagerness, whereas the mm. wolf, I suppose, he's a lot more crafty. He's cunning. He's and he cunning. Doesn't go yeah. straight ahead. He 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 plans his um his ways. You know. That's why the wolf is this very integral archetypal image throughout a lot of indigenous cultures and so forth. Whereas in the lion, when when you get to the sort of peak of your being as a man, the lion is power and strength mm, yeah. and, and will. You are you are volitional. And of course that mutes with age into into this cleverness and this mm. cunning and this prudence. I remember seeing as well, seeing some of the Da Vinci's later works, his later drawings when he was very old and he was in his 70s and his health was not so good. And you see quite a difference in Da Vinci's later works where you almost get the impression that these late drawings were someone who was kind of resigned to the fact he didn't have much time left and Mm. he was almost regretful about some things. Maybe he felt he hadn't completed know the works he set out to or his ambition had kind of been faltered whereas in this work by Titian I think you see kind of a lot more of as it says a prudence where he understands that not everything is going to go the way you expect it to and you shouldn't be so even if you're at the height of your power even if you are this lion you need to have craft you need to have tact it's like you know it's like in 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 Japanese wrestling (laughs) I have to relate everything to <laughs> you know you you were the champion you you know you were the best you were the ace but then as time goes on you become older it's like you have to change your move set you, you sort do, of step yeah, out of the limelight yeah. you have to give way to the newer and younger ones right and but I also this is this this is interesting to me as well because you have the the very direct sort of front on image of this man in his in his maturity 
But he's not looking directly at us. His gaze is kind of is off to one side. Side. And I felt yeah. like this is not really a, a directly confrontational man. He's looking. It feels to me like he's looking at something, a work he has to complete, or a, you know, he realizes that there are challenges in his life still. None of the faces really in this painting are directly confronting the viewer, and that's why you feel a sense of distance from this picture. You don't feel like that these are confronting you directly. They're talking to something else, you know, like we said, a, a metaphysical truth, or in this case, a truth about the, the transience of human life. But I find this funny about this work and about the Watts piece that we're going to talk about and about the sort of later Da Vinci that... The, the closer these titans of the art world, the closer they get to death, the more they realize that their existence is finite, is being towards death. At the same time, they're producing works that are at the one end singular, and at another end, more abstract, symbolic, allegorical. Mm. You definitely and, do see in, in yeah. Da Vinci's work as well, like I was saying, Towards the end of his life, he definitely did tend towards abstraction a lot more. He was a lot less interested in the intricacies of human anatomy and things, and I think he focused a lot more on natural phenomena, even to the point where they became abstracted, like he would do these mm. uh, swirling pictures of wind and water and uh, the way water would pool and eddy. And He was trying, trying to depict the intangible things. He was trying to depict something that was very, very fleeting and something that you couldn't really even grasp. This is something that I think to the mind of someone like da Vinci, it would have been something that was quite... Because uh, you know, there was no concept of photography or anything like that. You couldn't just freeze natural phenomenon in motion and really take a look at them and analyse mm -hmm. them. Something like the way water behaved or the physics of this would have been not really understood quite so well. And something, trying to represent this in art would have been quite an endeavour. And you see from the, the pictures he made... They're not really terribly successful uh, representing what they're meant to. And he did uh, certain ones of storms and of tempests and things and of great sort of catastrophes, which are very ominous and almost kind of biblical in their this sort of sense of doom. Mm -hmm. Again, towards the end of his life. Just oh. to come back to the, the Titian's allegory here, I'm interested in the way the way that these faces relate to the tropes we see over Messix, where you have these different types of men represented you know obviously you have the zoomer the boomer the kuma and they are simply a face that is represented in a flat way there's there's little care paid to whether this is meant to be seen as accurate in fact it's it's its own kind of folksy charm in the sense that these are not meant to be represented accurately at all like outsider art they don't even have ears you know the the, the wojak the classic wojak meme it doesn't have ears but they're presented in a way which enables them to tell a vast amount of stories and I think that they are meant to be looked at kind of as symbols in themselves and reflect an internal reality of young men particularly because we see this young man on the right here he's obviously he's naive he's eager he has a lot of energy and I think that this is perhaps a quality that Titian might have seen in you know the youth of his own day whereas the youth we see today you wouldn't ever say oh make sure you make sure you turn to the past and learn the lessons of the past in order that you don't mess up the present there isn't that yeah. sense of there isn't that time i don't think young people today really have even the time to consciously turn to the past and learn from old wise wolves well not even the future i think that the incredible crushing uh 21 megaton weight of the present is bearing down upon youth with such an, a vicious force, with an avariciousness <laughs> that even even idealists on the left, the the so-called futurists, they're not really imagining a future. They're imagining mm. a, a weird extension of the extension of the present. I well, mean, there's, there's a perpetual, there's there's a yeah. a stasis of everything. And Mark Fisher talks about this a lot in his uh, lectures and things. Talks about the way that culture is seems to have frozen and is very static well, yes. you, you get the impression that Titian was fully aware that true. Titian was fully aware that art after him as he neared the end of his life was going to change and he had in many ways set in motion a lot of those changes like you said with his mm -hmm. extra care he took to represent landscapes and uh, aerial perspective whereas you have today I suppose like you said a, a crushing down 
there's a churning of culture where it all kind of goes round in a circle, but it doesn't really feel like that there is a future to move towards. No. You don't have the this art- young, young, eager dog. I don't really see you know, yeah. young men act this way. They, they have a lot more cynicism, I think, than could be represented here. Well, we, we live in the age of pure cynical reason, as Slaughter Dyke said. I mean, it, it, it's true. Two points. One of them would be that our art is in the service of a total permanent, big, long, now present. And even in terms of the past, in terms of tradition, the past is an alien world to most young people. And the future equally seems like an alien world because the present and the... I think because internet time has a lot to do with this because one year in the internet almost feels like an eternity. And so we are just so hyper-focused on the now, the concerns of the present, that to sort of the archetypal boomer telling the doomer to look at the past. A boomer is not just somebody who's in their 60s now. A boomer is somebody who could be 30 years old. There's an accelerative process. The only difference is that unlike the accelerationists, we're not accelerating to a future. It's just that we're accelerating to more uh, minute integers of the present. I would like to turn now to this uh, Bronzino, Venus, Cupid, Folly and Time, which I always used to know as simply called an allegory with Venus and Cupid. And uh, I know about this painting because I used to look at it very much when I was a young man, if you know what I mean. Uh, it was in a, in a book I used to have just about history of art in general. And I was always just struck by how viciously erotic this picture is. It's like ridiculously sexy. When when you see it in real life, I mean, you see people, women often go up to this painting in the National Gallery and they look at it for a very long time. There's something about this which is, at the same time, it's, it's very creepy and very eerie. If you want to take, like, the modern art history major cat lady version of it you would say that oh this is the male gaze but it is the male gaze let's face it it is is the male gaze it certainly is uh, I'm I'm struck first by how wonderfully well composed it is as a picture I mean it's it's tremendously well balanced the composition of elements yeah exactly you've got this wonderful parallel lines being created here by Father Time's uh, right arm running along the top parallel edge of the painting and also Venus's right leg they both mirror each other here on the top and the bottom and then you've got Cupid's sort of arched body being mirrored by the little uh, I don't know he's meant he's meant to represent folly this rotund little child kind of running in here to splash um, rose petals all over them the obvious interpretation of this which you just get from one glance of it is you've got Cupid and Venus engaging in a, a lustful sort of embrace here it's obviously it's it's clearly sexual it's transient uh, it's not done with any thought in mind it's not really done with any kind of consideration of the past or the future you're going with yeah. your, your your lusty feelings and she is equally engaged in it as him and then around them you see obviously these the symbols yeah. represented that the, there's huge amounts of symbolism in nearly every corner of this this picture but this is an allegory yep. so the context of these symbols is important to the picture itself you're meant to consider this as a whole and take each element carefully in consideration as it relates to each other element exactly i mean you have father time pulling away the curtain yeah that was that was the bit, <laughs> that was the part that yeah. always kind of really struck me as well as he's He's got a very knowing look about him. And now is, is he pulling away the curtain or is he uh, is he concealing them? Or is uh, it, it always kind of confused me because they seem to be this figure on the left, the top left. The feet, yeah. Is she represents so, fate, does she? I think so, yeah. There's a little thing about here about the scholarly debate surrounding this. So the two central figures are recognisable as Venus and Cupid. And she holds the golden apple that she won in the Judgment of Paris. And he sports the characteristic wings and quiver. And this is also incest. <laughs> this is incestuous, oh, by God. the way. So he's, oh, God. He's, um, he's her Real flowers son. in the attic. Woo! And the bearded bald this figure... This could be like a modern anime. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, the bearded bald figure in the upper right of the scene is believed to be time. And obviously this is, this is quite an easy kind of representation because you know, mm-hmm. say Father Time and he, he very much looks like Father Time and he has an hourglass on his back oh there you go and we so can, we can words, talk a bit later about, about uh, Watts' interpretation of time as well because exactly. I know Watts he did uh, yeah but here, here time 
in this piece is the great revealer of all contradictions because this love, this eros that is purely carefree, not very th- thoughtful, it's going to lead to tragedy eventually. Yes, absolutely. I think, yeah. and, and look and at the And he knows, he's, he's aware of this, you know. Exactly. Father Time is aware of this. He's looking on. But look what he's pulling the curtain back to. To the face of tragedy. The famous mm. like black pill screaming face of it despair. Says, it, it says here, again, it is difficult to interpret. So he's sweeping his arm out, Father Time. But it's difficult, mm-hmm. it's difficult to interpret his gesture with any certainty. It could be to prevent the figure on the far left of the picture from shielding the incestuous transgressions of Venus and Cupid with the billowing blue fabric so it could be that time like you said is is actually revealing the uh, iniquity of this mm. and many scholars believe that this gesture seems to say that time is fleeting and you never know when it may all be over the figure's opposite time is also grasping at the drapery is usually called oblivion because of the lack of substance to its form like you said this is this is a nihilistic uh, black pilled eyeless masked sort of figure you see in a lot of works by Klimt, his more symbolic works, I'm pretty sure that there is a direct uh, homage, this sort of thing, where you have at the upper corners of Klimt's paintings, like Hope One, for example, you see a lot of these gnarled and uh, mummified-looking almost faces of these horrible women who represent you know, death and old age, folly. Well, even and- his, work, the, the, his work, The Play of Death and Life, you know, death is always stalking the yes, vibrant, right. and, vivacious women in the corner, you know? Yeah. And death is always kind of lingering on the outside of the composition, wanting to come in, whereas we're meant to focus our eyes here in on, you know, this, this brightly lit, erotic scene yeah. in the middle, but it's always on the peripheries that lurks this dark, these darker aspects of human nature. And exactly, and look at the, the Doomer face, and look at what's on the other side being shadowed by Cupid on the other periphery. You have serpent skin and you have the masks the persona mm, yes that's i mean right. that's that's huge if you're a youngian you know your your spidey scent your your tingles should be tingling right now as and i this, am this creature is a chimera you know she has a lion kind of legs a snake-like body with a tail and her arms are bent in this very kind of weird almost uh, occult esoteric looking sort of gesture one bed like an alchemy, her. the serpent. Mm, it's presented very, very strangely, but she's looking with this kind of dead, blank gaze towards them. Uh, and there's a honeycomb, I believe. This is a honeycomb in her hand on the left. Hmm. If, you, if you zoom in very closely, and there's also some other thing in her other hand. Yeah, and, and of course, the serpent is in every culture and every religion is the most one of the most powerful symbols, and. This is what we mean by symbolism. I mean, there's so much going on here. The mask, the persona, and and you so have this... explain to me a little bit more about what these these potential masks here and why why these masks he might have included these masks in this painting itself. Um, well, well, you know that throughout a lot of wisdom tradition throughout the Bible, even a young talked about this in the Red Book when he had a dream about Salome. Um, being one with uh was it elijah yes elijah the the prophet where there's always this unique connection between the old man and the young maiden Mm. and it has to do with sort of and of course clint painted this you know there's old men groping very beautiful young women with children and they're fertile and they (laughs) look so rosy cheeked um because there's that sort of connection that the whole painting here really embodies, which is the connection between Eros and Thanatos. Yes, that's right. The one that produces life, the one that produces death. So you have Father Time, you have Despair, which is, of course, Thanatos. Uh, Everything will lead to a being towards death. You have the Persona Masks, so you have this recognition of the falsity and the sort of pastiche of that pr- is produced by Eros. We sort of have to wear a mask when we're courting a lover. And so you have those archetypal roles. And this, this creature here, I'm just reading, is supposedly representing uh, pleasure and fraud. Mm-hmm. And obviously she's, if you look a bit more closely, I've realized this is, this is a scorpion sort of tail that she has uh, extending out 
behind her in the other hand. So there's a poison that she's offering them something sweet, and behind this is obviously uh, some kind of tragic element where you know you you get something sweet, but you get something uh, very very nasty. Uh. It's the serpent's promise in the garden, obviously. <laughs> I mean, and, and to bring this back to the symbolists, I mean, right here, some of the major symbolists had this influence by painting chimeras painting androgynous beings mm. almost like proto uh, you know post-human art uh, right from page 117 uh, we have the siren next to a painting by by uh, Alexandra Sion oh, yeah, the chimera's despair the, the chimera's dis- despair <laughs> so you have almost a direct link to the serpent being in this painting when I was younger and I read about this, uh, I also read that this figure on the left who's grabbing her hair and sort of screaming in despair, this is a female figure, I think. No um, way! The old woman is rending her hair on the left. It's been called Jealousy, um, although some believe her to represent the ravaging effect of syphilis, <laughs> which, is quite, <laughs> which is quite terrifying. Um See, nowadays I don't know if people would really be brave enough to represent the darker side of sexual promiscuity or sexual liberal uh, liberal values. Well, on the contrary, I think that even the darker sides of sexual liberation are depicted in such a way as to be positive. As figures in art represent, I'm very much drawn to these uh, feminine figures where you have these bare-breasted women and they're often screaming about something and... The, as well as the women who go on the slut walks, there's there's a few pictures I recently found, or someone someone in the server shared them, where you have these women and they're crying uh, whilst on the slut walk and they have their breasts exposed, and they really strike me as very tragic figures, very art worthy as a symbolic thing. Women kind of untethered from they're they're let sort of run free in this free sexual sexually liberated world but they express tremendous regret and pain and they're almost kind of torn apart by this thing things that were done to them and they express them in this sort of agonized way in a way of acting out and they, they want to be seen by the world you know this is something where they express this very openly these these women that do this well, Mattress Girl comes to mind. The ma- yeah, absolutely, yeah. He's the archetype of this. Emma Sokka is, 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 I think, go into this a little bit more, because I'd like to talk a bit more about kind of representing sexual liberation and how mm-hmm. it's handled today. Well, I, I think to bring this back to the symbolists, they were, throughout the book even, it goes into great depth about how they were obsessed with the image of the femme fatale mm. and of the, the Eros being a foil for Thanatos, and so you have. What, what do you mean by a foil man. exactly? So you mean that they have a sort of antagonistic relationship where you can't really have one without the other. Exactly, the lust for Eros, the lust of women, it inevitably brings about lead, generates Thanatos. It generates a jettisance that leads to the destruction of, you know, this is very, you know, that's a Lacanian term, but leads to the jettisance, the overbearingness of total ecstasy and pleasure mm. that eventually leads to one's destruction and it inevitably and co- collapses in on itself yeah exactly but the thing is you could only say that in this time period the symbolists and the pre-raphaelites and the other artistic movements that came after them depicted the femme fatale in such a way that leads them to a almost an objectification but not in the negative sense but yes, you could say the male gaze is there. That's a reality. Mm. But it's transformed but, but, in a way where you're intended they're to... They're enticing. They're mysterious. The intention they have for you to look at this woman is not simply to arouse your passions. They use your passions as a way to transmit the image to you, as in the the, you know, the metaphysical image. So this exactly. is simply used as a vehicle rather than... You know, I would say in, in a lot of the sort of art around the turn of the century, uh, for example, John William Godward, where you have a lot of these very pretty women represented in a, obviously erotic way. You know, they're wearing this sheer clothing and their breasts are exposed. Mm-hmm. They're meant to be eye candy. They're meant to be looked at in a sort of softcore porn way almost. But there's no other dimension behind it. There's no... Uh, there's nothing, no message really meant to be transmitted other than here is a body of a beautiful woman. It's you know good in itself, and look at the way I've painted it. Whereas in something like 
Sorry, a lot sorry. of academic paintings strayed towards that as well. Yeah. Of just like depicting yeah, voluptuous women, kind of like Peter Paul. Although Peter Paul Rubens had depth, I shouldn't lump him in there. That's kind of. An <laughs> I think I think Rubens just loved really sexy women, and I think that the, the stories the stories were primary always, but the sexy women yeah. were uh, definitely not going to be missed. Not going to be missed out on. <laughs> <laughs> to return to this idea, I would say of the that, femme fatale. Yeah. Yeah, the femme fatale is within its own place in time. I think that the and femme fatale... Just to, just, has, to as, just to run this down as we understand it, the femme fatale, yeah. obviously, this is an alluring female figure or you know, it can be an archetypal female. It doesn't have to be representation through history, although you have you know, figures like yeah, Sal- Salome, for example. Salome. Well. Like the Sphinx is represented as a femme fatale as well in the tale of Oedipus. You know, she's obviously... You, ask, you answer the question correctly, otherwise you're literally killed. You know, there's, there's, so that's where there's, there's always an element of danger and death uh, involved. But there's an enticing danger there. There's that uh, sacred link between sex and death. The le, pi- le petit mon, right? <laughs> le petit mon, yeah. Le petit mon, right, but... But I think that in in contemporary art, and you could say that these you know slut walks are sort of like a perform mass performance art because it's you know clown world whatever, right? <laughs> um, you, you could say that the femme fatale has lost its allure not because it's quote unquote canceled because it's misogynist male gaze. The femme fatale itself, uh, so something you said struck me there that the femme fatale is a way that the male psyche expresses a deep fear about women exactly. and, about, and about its own fragility, I think, as well. This is a way yeah. which men men love to represent dangerous women in art and women who could kill them because in real life, you know, it's often the case where w- women, they often say that today, oh, I'm constantly afraid of men, I'm terrified of um, what men might do to me if we are alone really, together. really, that's an inversion. That's an inversion. Throughout history, it's been the opposite. Well, I, I, mean, don't, I even, don't know if it's been a. In, I don't know if it's an inversion in a physical. Of course, always been violence in, against women. It's a reality, yeah. But but it's in ahead. a psych, in a psychic sense. I'd say that men are deeply on a on a foundational level terrified of women destroying them. Absolutely, and this yes. is where I think you'll find the roots of the um, the PUA movement and the MGTOW movement. Incel psychology. In, and yeah. this leads on naturally to incel psychology. But incel is kind of the bastard child of, of MGTOW and PUA movements where... The manosphere, yeah. The, there's no attempt even to try anymore there's just a there's a there's nothing but resignation but it's it's a bitter resignation whereas a mugtow it's a resignation in the sense that it's a it's intentionally a willful resignation or it should be at least right? yeah and there's of course the smattering of like self-help on the surface i'm just looking here at franz von stuck uh, the kiss of the sphinx and this is a perfect example of what we were talking about where in a symbolist work eros and thanatos are perfectly in line this is non-canon um, because the kiss of the Sphinx means death, essentially, and Oedipus exactly, did yeah. answer this riddle correctly. So von Stuck here, he's taken something and he's extrapolated this into a fantasy realm where we're forced to kind of disconnect ourselves from the story itself, from Ovid's story or whatever, and simply look at sex and death male desire and a female it's a divine fan fiction in some <laughs> it's a metaphysical but my fan original fiction point, my original point was that now that you mentioned the incels mm. um, it's it's a deep fragility that the femme fatale expresses in the male psyche that is a way of almost the overcoming of the femme fatale is also another great motif that gets into some like very morally ambiguous territory to mm. say the least you know Nietzsche he had that famous quote and people thought you know he's this great sexist or whatever but it, he was saying something deeper to the male psyche he said men love danger and men love play women are dangerous play things yeah right and throughout literature yeah. throughout and that says uh, nothing that says nothing baby. of the nature of women themselves that simply speaks no, to the no. way that men conceive of women and the way that men would like women to be um, exactly and this but is the this eagerness is... that you see this dog, this character of this, you know, young man, he's represented by an eager dog who rushes in and he simply, you know, he can make a terrible mistake. He could get himself some kind of incurable disease or something, or he could have a <laughs> child he doesn't want to have. This is the fear that plays on, I think, a lot of young men's minds today, especially men who've 
maybe had bad experiences with women, but also men who've never had experiences with women. It's the symbol itself has been so deeply ingrained in men's minds of right. the femme fatale and of the woman who will take everything from you and will destroy you essentially. That this doesn't, this is transmitted mimetically now and doesn't even need to be based on any kind of real experience. No. But I would say that in the modern world, my main point would be that the femme fatale archetype in art is almost an impossibility. It's been so driven to oblivion in terms of the omnipotence of the gynocratic female power in the minds of young men that the femme fatale isn't no longer an artistic object because it's just fear, fear, fear all the way down and the enticing, mysterious, uniquely feminine, you know, let's call it <laughs> lunar consciousness of the, the feminine, that's almost been completely obliterated by politics, mm. by modern politics. So now um, the femme fatale is just purely a thing of danger. A lot of these pieces yeah. I'm talking about here where we have these women represented as you know, a dangerous sphinx or something like this. These these were created in a time before women's liberation, or in a time right. when women very much had a male designated place in the world, or they there were a lot more social expectations on women. Um, yes. I'm obviously not making a moral judgment on this, but at this point, is it redundant? I suppose to say put these uh, same artistic attributes to women whereas I think women themselves are victims of the femme fatale more than anything today yes. uh, rather than oh, men that's a good point. there is some joy to be found in being presented in this way I mean Klimt to me is the master of doing this where he represents women as you know they're completely within their own sphere of agency they have right. power as women but they also have power as symbols which goes far beyond any of their attributes as women well, I think you could even say that, you know, because the Viennese school, of course, the Viennese session had a lot of symbolism in it, was inspired by the symbolists in Art Nouveau and so forth. You could say that there's almost that Emersonian transcendentalist idea that is present in all perennialism in that to love the woman or to love a thing or to love Eros, mm. it, it's the love that transcends beyond the mere person and becomes symbol for divine love. Mm, so absolutely. in Klimt, you look at his figures. I mean, you look at my favorite painting, which is, you know, the play of death and life. And you see that women, some of them are old and decrepit, but then there's the ones that are very voluptuous and pretty and, and they have children and they're mm. fertile. Nowadays, among the incels, fertility is like a very powerful archetypal fetish, you know. That's very, very, very interesting. Yeah. I mean, yeah. this whole idea of women as capable of generating life you're seeing that in itself as something that's being subverted today and turned... and fetishized mm. i mean why like i hate to be lewd but why do you think things like you know the the cream pie yes, and yes, no absolutely. birth control why are those things fetishized those were just the natural order why is there whole <laughs> pornography fetishizations of natural processes because of the sexual revolution at the one end we're liberated but the other end we're subjected to forces of surveillance and control this is a Foucauldian point it seems that we've con gone right back to fetishizing things like fertility and and uh, natural copulation mm, yes that is that's... In, in ways that are detached from their natural being they're, they're certainly detached from spirituality my that god is, I'm just I'm tingling right now <laughs> with all of these great points but, but... To, to go back here to the way that these women were represented as symbols, you also have Rossetti's work. Mm -hmm. And Rossetti, obviously, he was very much in love with another man's wife, and he <laughs> had an affair for many years with, with Jane Morris. And he painted Jane Morris in these ways where she's obviously the, the archetypal figure in most of his, uh, particularly his later work. But Rossetti, obviously, he, he elevated this form of this woman. He was not trying to paint this woman he was essentially painting an archetype you know, he was the ideal behind the woman yeah yes. absolutely and this ideal for him was an all-consuming dantean sort of love for him i think was very much in conflict with a lot of the you know the aspects of his personality where you know he was addicted to uh, drugs and he died quite miserable as far as i understand where he felt like even though you had this tremendous and transcendental love of this woman just it like in 
just like in the allegory of Cupid following time, you know, you never know when Father Time is about to pull that curtain and to show that it's all vanity, really. And you know, your paintings are going to survive, but you yourself inevitably are, are annihilated by this. And I this think, is a femme fatale. Yeah. This this way he painted Jane Morris. There's an element of danger. There's an element of confrontationality about her. She's often very direct and larger than life. And it is yeah. There there is an undercurrent of guilt I think and there somewhere but there's also a frustration I, th- I think again this comes from his deep kind of uh, being deeply infused with Dante the idea of a courtly love or the idea of a love that is transcendental and doesn't really touch the physical the physical is often disappointing the physical almost corrupts the transcendental yes. nature of that relationship that, this is what I mean like you really couldn't produce such artwork in the age of sexual liberation. I mean, it would be the the scandal, the guilt, the pull towards the metaphysical. It's not there. We could formulate on ways to re- recapitulate that. Maybe sort of inverting these images of these feminine heroes, like, like my recent piece, uh, the griping of Emma Solkowitz. But <laughs> what I was going to say, that's a brilliant point you've mentioned. And, and even Young famously talked about this in his essays. Um, Modern Man in Search of a Soul, mm. where he talks about the artist directly. You know, art and the artist. He talks about how the artist becomes annihilated by their own artwork because they are merely a conveyor of these unconscious forces. Just to come back here, I'd, I'd like to talk about. Um... George Frederick Watts. Oh, yes. Finally. Because, I mean, he is a towering figure of British art and you know, he's been called uh, England's Michelangelo. And his art's very ubiquitous in uh, London. You know, you see it in uh, the Tate Gallery and in the National Gallery. And in um, Hyde Park, there's actually a vast statue that he created. And it was one of the only statues I think he made, or the only sculptures he made in his life. It's mm. called uh, Physical Energy. Um, and there's actually a copy of this statue in uh, the memorial to uh, Rhodes, which is not politically correct at all for these days. Yeah. Um, oh, Cecil Rhodes. Cecil Rhodes oh Memorial has a massive uh, George Frederick Watts uh, statue atop it. He, he was a, a painter of portraits and a painter of representational scenes and what you'd call social realism. You've got these scenes uh, talking about certain aspects of Victorian life, particularly social aspects, which he found to be... Uh, which, which pulled at his heartstrings, you know, particularly the plight of the poor people in factories and this growing industrialization, which is a current you see in very much of uh, mid to late 19th century art. The, the artist is injured or wounded by what he sees as a result of industrialization and the dehumanization it causes. But also you have, as, a, as an element of Watts' work, you have these pictures which are hugely symbolic and they're very separate. I think that you can really clearly separate a lot of his work into the social realist stuff, the portraiture, and also the purely symbolic stuff. These were vast, vast pictures that were you know, often monumental in scale, and he wanted them to be seen by everybody, uh, particularly people of lower classes. These were, these were grand concepts, and these were concepts he wanted to convey to a large amount of people. The one which I'd like to look at first is time, death, and judgment. You have the figure of death here on the right, and this is not a traditional representation of death. Uh, mm-hmm. as you know, we're probably everyone's aware of the Grim Reaper and his traditional skeletal kind of representation. You've got death here as this very forlorn-looking woman, very, very heavily robed. You know, all of the robes and all of the, the draperies in his work, it's almost like it's sort of formed out of this lava-like substance. You know, it's, it's like crags or rocks. They have a very, very monumental quality to them, and the paint's very thickly applied. But the, the conveyance here is very clear. You've got time striding forward on the left, um, and he's this blind and very sort of stalwart figure. Time just marches mm. straight forward. Whereas he's, he's not even looking at you. He's looking past you on, in some ways. Yes, that's right. In contrast to the sort of quite uh, grandfatherly representation of time you saw in the, uh, in the Bronzino. And who's the woman in the back? And the, the woman in the back is meant to be Judgment, so she's got the scales there. Oh, I see. And her face is deliberately 
hidden or masked by her arm. And these these figures are not really based upon any on in particular. They're meant to purely represent archetypes, and they're, they're not even really painted in a way as to convey humanity or warmth. These figures, they're almost, you know, they don't really have life to them. Although there is more depth, there isn't a deliberate flatness as you see in there's, something like Botticelli. There's emotion within their their actions and the drapery, and you get the sense that they're marching on in an indifferent manner to humanity itself. Yes, that's right. This is interesting the way he's managed to convey this in the painting itself. And this is conveyed in many ways by, by the scale of the painting, particularly these are often two metres in height, you know, mm. and very weightily painted. When he began the idea in the 1860s, there were just two figures, time with his blind eyes and the scythe on the left and death gathering flowers on the right. And both figures were youthful and beautiful in strong contrast to their traditional personifications. So it's interesting here that he's tried to deliberately subvert some, you know, because people, people have these cliched representations, I think, of, you know, particularly in today's world, which is the world of sound bites and, you know, 30 second mm-hmm. videos. What do you think of when you think of death? You know, you think of a skeleton. <laughs> yeah. But even in that way, skeleton. it's not, it's kind of disconnected from anything really representing death. Because m- most people don't really see death these days. Death is not really very common. Um, yeah, it's the, the Ernst Becker denial of death sort of thing. We have to put it foremost out of our minds and therefore living inauthentically, you know, qua Heidegger, qua Becker, is to deny death in such a way that it's not coming to terms with it. It's just the now. And when death inevitably arrives, I suppose... You know, it's graceless. It yes. doesn't have a weight to it. Because it's not it's really not been contemplated. contemplated. Yeah, because it's, it's not been contemplated at all. And this picture, I think, was... What's his intention for people to contemplate these processes and to contemplate this inevitability of things? And the Victorians were very much, I think, reflective in that way. They they did meditate on death a lot because death was all around them. Yeah. <laughs> and look what happened after the Victorian period. Yeah. More death. <laughs> more death. And death, death that was so vast a scale, I think, that people couldn't really even comprehend it. There were no paintings to be made with you know romantic representations of, of death and, and judgment after World War One. I. I think that we're still kind of coming to terms with the fact that we don't really have these days anything other than simple commercialized cliches to really explicate these things. Like, you know, how would you represent time in art today um, in a way which can be understood by masses of people? What is the idea of judgment? How do you represent judgment in art? Because oh, we have to we destroy judgment in art. <laughs> yeah, judgment well, judgment has no place. Life, I don't know, you know if judgment really. How how would you represent judgment in art? I'm not sure, and I, it's something I'd like to attempt at some point. When it comes to time in particular, in the contemporary art world, you have um, you know installation artists and people like that doing like very clever, like matter of fact ways that uh, is just pure materialism. Mm. So you'll have people that would take the observations of time by science like how long it takes to do this and they'll like write numbers on a screen or they'll try to depict it in light or something it's all just cleverness though it's all just material cleverness it's cleverness (laughs) it's in a very matter of fact way of expression that doesn't have very you know archetypal literary symbolic or spiritual content although you know you have you do have something like uh Alex Gray's work where many people you know can look at this work and have some kind of emotional connection to it or they feel like that that it speaks to something that's key to all humans and there's a contemplation of death there which is very rare mm. in the contemporary art world I shouldn't say rare because I mean for example I wrote a whole article with Damien Hirst yes if that's, that, that's the obvious um, you know yeah. it, the impossibility of death in the mind of someone living <laughs> in um, the minds of those who are living but which I is a good that, piece. Which is a piece of work I, I'm fond of. It's good. Um, yeah, I like it. I mean, I don't. I mean, people look at that and they're like, "This is murder." It's a powerful I, piece. I, it's it's a, it's a, it's undeniably powerful, mainly because of the the, ele- the the element that's used is a shark, you know, and the sharks are genuinely a primordial and terrifying thing, almost in the same level as death itself. 
Exactly, and it's it's the only way I think Damien Hirst could bring the primordial into contemporary art discourse without like being totally rejected in the way that visionary artists like Alex Gray are mm. as like you know it, oh this is like it's certainly you know, a lot more of a you know that Hearst the piece by Hearst is certainly more of a gut punch than anything that Alex Gray could ever I think create um, oh god oh <laughs> wow I think I think so because a lot of visionary art is sort of like it's almost gimmicked in a way like when you see an Alex Gray piece it relies on a lot of fluff i think a lot of stuff that kind of surrounds yeah. surrounds the the elements it's dressed up a lot whereas something like hearst that that piece by hearst is the very opposite of dressed up exactly it's 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 mortifying in a way <laughs> for like literally mortifying and i but, think that like even even as like visionary art in the modern world sort of went on it became this like you know empowering spiritual slash self-help like a uh, trans festival like it even went away from the darker side which is people like biskinski and geiger mm. we'll have to have, it's a, funny, have a proper it's funny talk how we, about geiger and, and uh, yeah the, we have to have a whole episode talking about geiger um but it's funny how we sort of crossed oceans from symbolism all the way to damien hurst and how that's sort well, of like <laughs> that to me yeah. is, is is a that's a very kind of epitome of symbolism where there is like something that's powerful and it's singular in, in singular and it injects itself into your mind through the way the artist has chosen to present it when we're talking here about this move into you know towards abstraction this piece again by Watts it's called The Sower of the Systems another super interesting piece which I'd like to talk about a little bit where and again another piece that he painted right before he died yes that's right it's like one of his last paintings <laughs> yeah and it's oh my god it's at the Art Gallery of Ontario now I have to like go and see it so. really this is oh wow okay yeah incredible so just to describe this painting quickly I mean this is an obvious representation of some kind of cosmic figure I mm-hmm. suppose you'd call it a god but I don't know if he really even because in terms of his religious uh, beliefs I think he drifted further and further from traditional uh, Christianity which was kind of the order of the day in the mid to late Victorian period it was assumed that you were a Christian right. but towards you know he died in 1904 and I think towards the end of his life he was probably fascinated slightly more with the advances in science and the advances in uh, photography and like it says here he was uh, fascinated by the latest astronomical devices and Watts has been especially struck by seeing early long distance photographs of remote solar systems um, inspired by the casual observation of Lant dancing across his ceiling at night the work surface is punctuated by vigorous streaks, splashes and dabs of paint yeah, lending it an element of dynamism no, I think it's so interesting because he's trying to come to terms with new explorations and sciences, but he's doing it in such a way that in the way that the pre-Raphaelites observe nature, he is also observing a hyper nature through the tools of science that comes all the way back to a metaphysics. To me, this is like way better than like a million digital renders of vision, visionary mm. art that we have nowadays because it's the first encapsulation of spiritual abstraction that you see echoed in Greek iconography, echoed in, in certain, you know, forms of Chinese literati painting and Zen art mm. is he's trying to depict the cosmos in a way that breaks from tradition to experience a more primordial tradition. And the thing that strikes you about this work is you, you can feel that there is a struggle to depict this subject this is Watts' quest to depict what his wife had termed the unpaintable subject. Um, yes, exactly. Now this is um, him coming to terms with his own ideas of God or a creator or even a creative force. And you can see that this figure is turned away from us, which is, to me, it's tremendously interesting in depictions of what you'd call God the Father. If this, mm-hmm. feels, this feels like you know a man of great power, great strength. I wouldn't even, maybe not even call it a man, a figure he's vast in his presentation you feel like he's almost stepping up and over some uh, completely endless horizon 
into, into the numinous. Yeah, exactly. Into the, like it says here from this article from his wife, like a child's design who being asked by his little sister to draw God made a great number of circle circular scribbles and putting into his paper on a soft surface struck his pencil through the center making a great void hmm. conceding that this would be utterly absurd in pictorial terms he still felt there was a greater ideal in it than in Michelangelo's old man with a long beard <laughs> that's right well he, he's obviously consciously determined himself I'm not going to paint an old man with a long beard but you can tell that there is an intention there or that there is that imprint is still kind of in his mind here you almost feel like this figure mm -hmm. could potentially turn around and there would be some kind of um, fatherly figure there but at the same time you know that this figure is never going to turn around and this is he's stepping off into what we can only you know we can barely even contemplate with our poor uh, astronomical devices it's, it's funny in a way because I, I, I wrote this quote down in, in the book while I was reading it. By the time you get to Watts and the, the later symbolists, and we could talk about this in another episode, um, you have less an observation of nature like you have in Moreau or Chavonet, where they're taking inspiration from, pre, from the pre-Raphaelites. Mm. Now you have what Jackson Pollock, you know, before he went on a... Uh, alcohol fueled uh, rage John and he crashed his car and killed himself and a mistress um, he said when someone said to him I think it was an art critic or a professor that said you have to to be a good artist you have to depict nature you have to be closely attuned to nature mm. but Jackson Pollock you know in some ways it's like zen but also it's like this you know edgy New York he said I am nature I am nature. In, in a way, the inklings of the, that sentiment of expressionism, of a cosmic phantasmagoria of not even images, but lines and figures and splatters and, and numinous space, that is all echoed from the symbolists like Watts mm, to say that now I am nature. You know, nature is something metaphysical, something beyond. It isn't just the landscape or the seascape. Even Paladin, in his rules, he said, you know, no landscapes, no seascapes, unless it's necessary, unless it's depicting the divine. And I think that's very interesting, because nowadays, in in the age of pretty pictures, it almost seems like this, this impulse to depict an inner nature is lost. Mm -hmm. I think we love a pretty image, right? You can really, really sense, I think, in this, even even from looking at a digital representation, let alone the original painting, mm -hmm. I think you can really sense that he's struggling with this concept and it's a work of great uh, inner contemplation and it, it's very personal. At the same time, it strikes you with its mystery. You know, there's there's a real mystery there and there's a real struggle to understand something. But he knows that this is something that is... is beyond the realms of human conception. Exactly. It's trying to express something that is inexpressible. And this is it more is. explicit. You're right that this is far more explicit in something like a Pollock, where there's an assumption, particularly in earlier Pollock work, before he did his uh, drip paintings, yes. there's an assumption there that in these earlier works that these strange, you know, weird shapes coll colliding and collapsing upon each other... They're the kind of you know the the janglings of the universe. There's an impersonal nature. It's almost like they're machines. It's like a, like a Keith Haring graffiti. They're collapsing <laughs> on each other. But even Keith Haring, even even Keith Haring's work has figurative elements at least, even if they are highly kind of abstracted. Whereas I think Pollock, he didn't even feel the need to express anything no. related to a figure. I mean, I don't know if he he did do any representational. Uh, a little bit because he was highly influenced by uh, American indigenous art, mm. but they, but even still, it's like what you know. Again, to go back to Huxley, it's the antipods of the mind. It's, it wouldn't be what we termed in, in you know, through the European classical art as the figurative. It's something no, beyond absolutely. the figure. Yeah. You know, even the title of this really struck me: "The Sower of the Systems." Yeah, the divine system, the cosmic system. The Let's title's see. very telling, actually, because the systems, in terms of the solar system, and you know, that's probably 
as he would have understood it. But also, I'm sure there's an undercurrent there of saying, well, the, there are systems, and you understand this, I think, when you get to your 80s or whatever, how old he was, there's this idea in Hinduism that when when you're an old man, you should turn yourself towards the spiritual and attune yourself towards that after you've had a family and after you've had... Um, you know, you've you've done the labors of the physical, Sign, the, the rites of passage, yeah. And even you've you know you've you've had your maturity, like going back to Titian's work there, where you've had your mature phase. You should then attune yourself and turn yourself towards contemplation of the universe and the world, and, they and leave, thereby yourself. And they leave their families. They go off into the forest. They join mm. a sadhu. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. This is the joy to me of art, where it's like you have someone like Watts, Da Vinci and uh, Titian uh, they, they worked furiously right up until the hour of their death and yeah. there's a great joy in that and there's a great liberation in that which I think is one of the only things that really you can be free from capitalist realism by engaging in these days I, th- I think that that's being a creative and generative force right up until the, the hour of your death you know there's no there's no such thing as retirement for somebody like Watts the idea of the symbol that Watts is conveying here is that this is like the idea of an ultimate generative force. You know, this exactly. is, and this yeah. is a this is a god that's so interesting to me. This this is a god who is in the active process of creation, which is completely at odds Different. with is, is this is this is heretical to traditional orthodoxy of yes. Christianity, where God created the world once and He's not creating any more. He's not currently creating it. It's done. It was done in seven no, days. No. This is the god, in the, of, of course, the Watts exists in the same time frame. Uh, this is the god of, like, Alfred North Whitehead. Yes, that's right. This is the god of Spinoza, you know what I mean? This is... <laughs> yeah. But he's a god who's, as it says, he, he's sowing this system, but he's exactly. not curating it, he's he's moving on. and Creation and creator are working together in some ways, like in North Whitehead. This is, like, transcendentalism right here. This is panpsychism. You know, this is no longer the god of Christianity mm. where where it's like creation is done yeah. and there's essence and energy or whatever, right? This is, like, the god actively participating in creation. There's this, like, reciprocity that but you, the, you you find later on in these like all proto new age movements right but at the same time i still feel in this piece by what's that this is a god who is distant and he's not he's not directly engaging with the viewer he's completely concerned with other things and maybe mm. this is this is even somewhat of a of a gnostic uh, idea being conveyed here that he is abandoning the things that he is sowing you know he's he's simply moving through this abstract space mm-hmm leaving in his wake systems and things that you know we are left to deal with yeah the, what it, what you know like the eternal Tao that's between heaven and earth you know god is out of the picture in some ways yes so well, maybe not the god of north whitehead but certainly the god of gnostic christianity perhaps well i wouldn't uh, say he's he's a a figure of, uh, of gnosticism no I, no i wouldn't i wouldn't say this is a this is a malevolent figure here this is not a demiurge no. but this could be well you know what's this conception here is a god who is on you know he's not concerned with anything to do whereas the god of traditional christianity is you know he's intensely concerned with the affairs of, of uh, humanity you know he moves oh, in human yeah. history he he yeah. moves through the works of history what was it hegel the cunning of reason yeah exact exactly yes <laughs> That's sort of like, yeah, God is deeply interested in, in God is calling out through grace. Well, of course, this is a Catholic interpretation, but like through grace and works, mm. you know, God is calling forth to humanity to complete the soul. Like the soul is complete, but in order to participate in the divinity of, of you know, God and Christ. Whereas here, it's almost like god as an artist god as a creator in a more shall we say modern artistic sense in this painting is something almost heretical to that Mm. christian conception of god as the logos as being as something that is the foundation of all being here there's almost a heideggerian act of concealment and revealing that is present in all symbolist art that you would say that it's more mystical, it's more even quote-unquote heretical, it's not orthodoxy. 
it's there's an active concealment there mm. that you don't find in traditional depictions of Christian artwork unless you go back way way to the iconography so it's almost as if you're coming full circle into the primordial so I think we've covered the beginning of uh, well, we've, of we've covered <laughs> we've covered many great things here and I think yeah. In the next one, we're going to explore even deeper into these things and bring in some of our own uh, ideas as, and uh, pieces as well. Some of our own artwork, hopefully, as well. In a sort of next episode, I want to talk about some of my favorite paintings by uh, by Radon and, and Morrow and people like Absolutely, that. Absolutely, yeah. So. And I'll read it more deeply into these uh, these and artists Burn as well. And Jones. I mean, that's he's your guy. I'll bring Radon. You bring Burn <laughs> Jones. <laughs> But this has been a great episode. I feel we covered like a lot. Yeah, of we covered things. very many interesting things. All right. Well, I'll, we'll see you uh, in the next one. Goodbye. Farewell. <laughs>